Welcome to Humans of Teaching, a podcast that explores the unique and amazing ways that humans of all walks of life teach others. Let's learn something new. All right, welcome in, friends. You are here for our very first how-to episode of Humans of Teaching. One thing personally I've always wanted to do is write a book. Now, whether that happens in a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, it's something that is on my bucket list, and I'm willing to bet that many of you out there have something similar on yours. So today, we're lucky enough to be sitting down with Justin Calderon, a published author, author of LARP, The Battle for Verona taking a very unique concept of live action role play and coupling it with a very great theme of showing that no matter who you are or what you look like, everyone is worth something and everyone deserves to have a chance to shine. So Justin sits down with us and walks us through every single aspect of writing this book in particular. We learn about the process he took before the book, where the idea came from, how he knew that LARP was an idea that he should jump on. Then we talk about maybe mentors he had, specific physical ones, or maybe authors that inspired him to go into this writing process. Then we'll move in how to actually get started with schedules and deadlines and how to actually set up for the writing process. Then we'll move into the actual writing, how to begin the book, how to end the book, roadblocks, if you hit a wall, how to move through them. Then we move into the editing process, and Justin tells us how he was able to make it through over 10 times reading his book and editing it time and time and time again. And then concluding with probably the most important part, the publishing and marketing. Because no matter how hard you work on this book and how great it is, if you can't get it in front of the people... No one's going to read it. So folks, before we get into today's workshop and listen to Justin's story about how to write a book, I want to remind you that Humans of Teaching is of no cost to you, and we don't receive any type of support, sponsorships, or bog you down with advertising, right? So if you would be so kind as to make sure that before this episode is concluded, you make sure that you have subscribed, you have left a comment, you have left a rating to share with how you feel about Humans of Teaching and how we're currently progressing because it's with feedback from you that allows us to make this podcast better and better. So folks, sit back and listen to Justin Calderon walk us through his process of how to write a book. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into a new episode of Humans of Teaching. You're here sitting down for a workshop episode. These workshop episodes teach you a new idea, skill, or concept, and today's is very exciting. We are sitting down with published author Justin Calderon to learn how to write a book from start to finish, from the idea stages to the writing stages, editing, and eventually the publishing and marketing. I'm very excited for this. So, Justin, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you again so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to teach us. I've been speaking to many of our listeners, and they say that they're very interested in learning how to write a book. We have a lot of teachers and educators and learners of all kinds who want to share their knowledge that they have with the world. But from my experiences speaking to other published authors, I know it can be a very, very difficult, frustrating, and nerve-wracking experience getting ready to write a book when you've never done it before. So my first question for you is, what was your perception like in the steps before writing the book compared to you actually going in there and doing it? How did those experiences compare? I, you know, I was pre-prepared, I guess, mentally for what it was going to be because I've read a lot about how my favorite authors went about writing books. And I've never read anything by any author who said that they wrote a book and it was published and it was instant success and fame and glory. It's always a soul searching process because you write the book and you have the idea, and then everybody in the world tells you no, and you feel worthless. So, you know, that's a very, very common experience for even the greatest writers of the 20th century went through that experience. 
And it's important to go through, right? Because you may have this this idea that you think is amazing, but it takes a lot of work for people to know about it. I mean, personally, as a podcast host, I may think that this podcast idea is great and it has so much value to provide, but it takes a lot of work to be known and it takes a lot of work to be seen. So Justin, we're going to take this through five parts and you're going to walk us through it. And the first thing we're going to get into is before the book. Where did the idea come from? What was your writing space like? Then we'll move in how to start. Justin's going to walk us through how to actually start into this process. Part three will be the writing actually begins. How do you progress the story? Part four is the editing process. And then part five is something that can often be overlooked. It's the publishing and marketing aspect of it. So Justin, let's take us back to your most recent book that you've written. So your most recent book is called LARP, The Battle for Verona. I found the book personally fascinating and a really, really great story. So can you tell us where the idea for this book came from? How did you come up with the idea of LARP? Well, the idea came from two really kind of separate things that most people would not relate. Uh, I'm a teacher by trade. And, you know, I see a lot of kids getting bullied in school. You know, bullying is a problem, but it still goes on a lot. So I had this idea in my mind that uh, I'd like to kind of create something to sort of address the bullying issue and to show that all kids and all people by extension have value no matter who they are or what they do. So near my house is a park, and every Sunday my wife and I would go grocery shopping and we would drive past the park. And every Sunday we would see a group of LARPers outside practicing. For those who don't know, LARPing stands for live action role play, people who do battle reenactment. And they can do battle reenactment from, you know, the Civil War or Revolution or medieval times, but LARPing is just people who do battle reenactment. So my wife and I would drive past this park every weekend, and we would see this, this group of medieval LARPers practicing, and they would be out there with swords and with shields, and they would be beating the crap out of each other. So we would sit at the, at the, um, at the intersection, would be at the light there, and every Sunday for five or six minutes, however we're long at the light, we'd watch them just going crazy on each other. And there's a river near the park. And I said to my wife, just as a joke, I said, you know, what would happen if a group of like terrorists or bad guys crash landed uh, in a boat on the banks of the river and decided to invade this area of town? Would these LARPers run towards them or would they run away from them? And we just kind of laughed about it, but we got talking about it a little bit more. You know, these are people who are, you know, they're mailmen and they're teachers and they're plumbers. You know, they have normal day jobs, but they like to get dressed up in medieval gear on the weekends and, and have it out. So I got to thinking that, you know, these people have probably been marginalized by society because let's face it, doing this on the weekends in a park isn't something that, that is the most popular thing. So these people, I'm guessing, have taken some flack for their hobby and they're probably friends with other LARPers. They, they don't really have associations outside of their hobby for the most part. So I came up with the idea of merging the two things. How can I address the bullying issue while also doing a story about LARPing? Now, I've never LARPed in my life. I have no interest in LARPing, but I see it as a kind of a cool metaphor for what people go through in their lives. So I started to do some research on LARPing, and I worked with my wife to develop just some ideas. My wife is a very creative person, and she knew a little bit about LARPing. Then I got more into it as I started my research, and I started to talk to people who, who were seriously into this, people who have worked on movies, who had done, done consulting work. Uh, there was a movie about 10 years ago called Role Models, and LARPing is a, is a prominent feature of it. And I talked to some of the people who did the consulting work for that movie. And I had a staff, basically, of LARPers who were volunteering, advising me on this, and you know, incorporating some of my knowledge as a teacher as to what goes on in schools and how kids are treated. I developed a story that my hometown of Verona gets invaded by terrorists. The local authorities don't know what to do. So the LARPers take on the terrorists. And the people who are most marginalized by their society, as you see in the story, uh, end up becoming the most valuable in this situation. So 
Personally, to me, I have seen the movie Role Models. I grew up on role-playing games, so I find the idea fascinating. But I'm sure there was a time throughout this process that you thought, you know what, maybe this idea isn't going to reach as many people as I'd like it to. So personally, I have ideas for things all the time, whether it's projects or lessons to teach in class or side gigs to do to make some extra money. And I know many of our listeners are in the same boat. But oftentimes, these ideas don't really come into fruition. So Justin, what made you act? Well, my undergraduate degree is in professional writing. And I've always wanted, you know, like you said at the beginning, a lot of people want to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book. Um, and I go back and forth as to what I consider myself. I don't know if I consider myself a teacher who writes or a writer who teaches. I don't know. But, you know, I've been writing books since I've known that books were something that people can write. So around, I don't know, four or five years old, I've always had these sort of creative ideas in my head. And I still do. I, I can't turn it off. It's Writing, you know, is unique. It's not something that you do. It's something that you are. Uh, it's not like being, you know, an accountant or something where you go to school and you learn this trade and that's just what you are. Um, writing is something that you can't turn off. So, you know, what made me really want to pursue it is I thought it was a good idea. It already had a built-in audience. There's people all over the world who LARP, uh, but there's people all over the world, too, who have been marginalized by their society. So I saw a common ground here where at first it might seem like a niche idea, but it really isn't once you learn what it's about. So keeping in mind that I always wanted to write a book and I had this idea and I was a teacher and I had the time, I started writing it without any sort of end game. I just thought, okay, this is a cool idea. I'll just work on it. And as I got more and more into it and more and more creatively involved and invested, I realized that it was a pretty good idea and that I thought people would want to read it. So I saw it through to the end, and that's when I started uh, pursuing publishing. And having a meaning behind the book is certainly important. So even if the person isn't directly interested in LARPing, there's this overall goal behind it to show that you know people of any way, shape, or form, look, background, interest can do amazing things and should be accepted the way they are. I love it. So, Justin, more about the process before the book. Did you have any type of mentor or role model throughout your writing process that really helped you bring this book to life? No, it was just me. You know, I knew enough from, from undergrad about the process of how to write. But, you know, when you go to school for writing, you just do more writing and you get more critique. As I said, I don't think writing is something you, you can't teach somebody to be a writer if they don't have it in them. Just like you can't teach somebody to be a singer if, you know, they can't hear a key in a song. Uh, it's just something that you're able to do. And college helps to refine that. But I knew that, you know, OK, going into writing here, I had to create an outline. As ridiculous as it sounds and as much as we all hated outlines in college and you know, in high school, you got to do an outline to write a book. You can't just sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a book. But the key is that you do your outline and you know what the characters are going to do from chapters one through whatever, but you don't write the outline so that it's so minutely detailed that you're stuck to following the outline exclusively. Because as you're writing the book, the book starts to write itself. And you know, so you might know what the character is going to do in chapters one and two, but you don't want to write down specifics because as you're writing, you're coming up with new ideas. Um, so I just did like a general sketch of what was going to happen throughout the book. And I just let my own creativity take over. And, you know, the book kind of wrote itself as once I got going. For me, the way it works is, um, you know, when I'm writing, I'm seeing it in my head as a movie that's already happened. So, and I'm just taking notes. So when I wrote LARP, I saw the whole thing in my head and I was just writing down what I saw. I like that because you're, you're the visionary. You have the idea and you're outlining it from start to finish. And I've heard that about the writing process yeah. where being so specific in your outline can, can oftentimes backfire and frustrate you because the book does end up writing itself. And these characters that you create, you find that they wouldn't go through that phase that you have later on in the outline. So the more broad you are, the more freedom you get, and the more you can make this story become what it truly was intended to become. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Because you know the characters become more alive the more you hang out with them. And if you have a character do 
you know, an action in chapter one, and they develop in a way that the action in chapter one will have them uh, will have an effect in chapter three, but they develop differently in chapter two, then you're kind of screwed throughout the whole story. It's kind of like, you know, it's like Jenga. If you pull out one of the blocks too soon at the bottom, it can wreck everything at the top. So you just got to kind of be vague about it, but still have a direction. Beautiful. So we've moved past this this introductory part, getting the idea, the process before the book. You talked to us about the research that you did, and even the fact that you reached out to all of these people that would understand the world of LARP, as well as the research behind it. Super fascinating there. So I know writing a book can be a very intimidating and daunting task. For instance, there's some books that I won't even come close to just by seeing how many pages are in it. And that's just reading, not let alone writing it. So Justin, what was your writing schedule like? Did you set yourself up with a schedule? Did you have a process to make it more manageable? Did you give yourself deadlines? Talk to us about your writing schedule and process. You know, I didn't have any deadlines. I didn't have any schedule. I, you know, I tried to work on it every day, but I didn't say to myself, okay, today I have to write 20 pages and I have to write for two hours and get it done in that time. I would never do that to myself because that's pressure. Um, and writing, you know, should be pleasurable it shouldn't be pressure you know in, ba in the back of my head it was always happening uh the story it was always writing itself and throughout my work day because i was working full time i would maybe make notes on papers you know in between classes of ideas i came up with and at the end of the day when i came home i would write down all of my ideas or flush them out or on the weekends i would accumulate all the scraps of paper where i had things written down uh, i kept I do a lot of, when I'm really in like a creative frenzy kind of thing, uh, I get a lot of writing done uh, when I'm sleeping. You know, I, I dream a lot about what I'm working on. So I keep a pen and a paper next to my bed and I get up and I write it down. Uh, I had a little pen that had a, like a little light on it. So as soon as I turn the pen on, it would light up and I could just start writing stuff down. So, you know, there really wasn't a whole lot of discipline involved because my livelihood didn't depend on it. It was sort of like, okay, I'm going to write this book and whatever happens, happens. Hopefully something good will happen, but I'm not going to base my whole self-worth and my whole life on it. I'm just going to write it and, and hope that it happens. I think that's an important thing to share because oftentimes we see that whenever individuals who are looking to create or write a book, they watch these videos or, or attend these classes, they say you have to be consistent, you have to set a schedule, you have to make sure you have deadlines to make sure that you're consistent on this. Sometimes if you sometimes if you're passionate enough, you don't need to set those things because you're right, it can turn into a chore, it can turn into something that you don't want to do. And writing should be something that you do want to do that you love. So sharing that your process was very laid back and at your own leisure and at your own schedule, while you did make sure that you blended it into your everyday life where you could, it wasn't something that you forced yourself to do, which is a really good thing to share. Well, you know, there's, I, I wrote uh, another book called Revolutions. It was my first book that was published and it's a poetry novel. And in the introduction, I talk about how there's really two types of writers and I related to musicians. Mozart was the type where if you said to him, Mozart, sit down and write music. He would sit down and write you a song. He could do it like that. Beethoven, on the other hand, could not do that. He was the type of writer who had to be inspired to write. So he just wrote whenever it hit him. Uh, I'm a Beethoven type of writer. I could probably sit down right now and write you, you know, a two or three page story, but it might not be as good as something I come up with in 12 hours when I'm asleep and I dream it. So I would rather stick with something that is inspiring than something that's more mechanical. Now, if my life livelihood depended on writing stuff, then yeah, I would be here in my chair every day for eight hours writing. But, you know, like I said, it, it wasn't, you know, whether or not I wrote a book didn't pay my rent. So, you know, I wanted it to be more of a subconscious kind of development. Sure. Did you find that you had to adjust your life in any way to ensure that you did have the time and attention to focus towards writing? I mean, 
a lot of our listeners are full-time teachers and they want to write a book in some way, shape or form, whether it's an ebook or a short story or a full length novel or, or nonfiction book. So outside of keeping that journal next to your bed and writing things down or, you know, noting things down in class, you did have to physically sit down and write this book for hours on end sometimes. So how did you have to adjust your life? How did that affect the relationships around you when you did that? Well, when I wrote the book, I didn't have kids and um, I have two now. So, you know, if I wanted to sit down and take three hours to write a book on a Wednesday after work, I couldn't do that because there's karate and dance and, you know, everything else that I have to do. But, you know, at the time I would just come home and I would say to my wife, look, I got all these ideas that I collected today and I got to put it together. And she was completely supportive of it. So, you know, it really depends on the relationships that you have with the people around you. And what type of writer you are, if you're the, the Beethoven or the Mozart, you know, if you're the Mozart, you can get it done whenever you want. You can just sit down and knock it out. But if you're the Beethoven and inspiration hits during your kid's third birthday, then you got to do it. <laughs> you know, it just, just depends on, on what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's an interesting balancing act to do. Sure, you want if you have people in your life, whether it's your significant other, your parents, uh, your brother, sisters, friends that are there to support you and encourage you throughout the process, that is huge. But it's also important to understand that just like the life as a teacher, you know, your job isn't everything in your life. You need to make sure that you give time to your family, give time to your friends. So that is an interesting balancing act. But uh, I, I do agree. I couldn't imagine creating this podcast consistently and putting as much work into it as I do if I had kids. So I, I think that is a good thing to recognize that the less obligations and responsibilities you currently have is clearly going to make the process a little more easier and, and manageable. <laughs> And, you know, that's why um, a lot of the greatest artists of our time, I think, I, and I read this consistently, were not the best human beings, you know, because they were so into their art that they ignored everybody else. My all-time favorite writer is Jack Kerouac. He is the one who really turned the light on in my head and made me want to write. And I read his book desolation angels when i was 19 and it was like it was one of the great aha moments of my life where i read it and i said this is exactly what i want to do forever because you know when you're a creative person if you're a writer or a singer or a musician you're always looking for your voice you know what would you sound like if you did this and i read his book desolation angels and it was my voice it's exactly what I would want to sound like. Jack Kerouac was a writer who, uh, he hitchhiked across the country in the 1940s and the 1950s. And he wrote novels about his adventures. And what he did was his books were the spawn of the, uh, or the, I should say they spawned the, um, the hippie movement and the beatniks and every sort of counterculture movement that came after came out of his writings. So I highly encourage you to read On the Road or any of his books because they will completely destroy you. And uh, it's a style of writing you need to get used to because he writes stream of consciousness. So you need to hang on tight because some of his sentences could be two pages long. But, you know, his, his style, though, is that he doesn't just tell you what's happening in a situation. He tells you what's happening all around the situation. And that, to me, is what real writing is because... He's not just relating the facts like Hemingway does. He's hitting you emotionally and spiritually. And that's what I think good art does. So, you know, reading his books was like, I, I just, I can't even describe how massive it was to me. And that's what made me want to really pursue that in college and, and actually, you know, write a book. Sure. That's, that's a, an amazing thing to have happen. Uh, I'm sure all of us can really think back deeply on a time in our lives where something occurred to us, where it was a big aha moment that made us realize that this is the path we want to go after. And some people don't have that. And sometimes you have to put yourself in a situation to receive that. Maybe you never would have picked up that book and you never would have been put on this path, Justin. Probably not. Yeah, that's that's a pretty crazy thing to think about. Like if you never picked up that book, who knows where you would be? Yeah. So the more situations you put yourself in to get that aha moment, maybe you'll get it. Interesting. 
That was a great overview of the before the book and how we start, but now we're going to get into the writing process. You've talked to us about the emphasis that you put on outlining, um, but I've heard from many authors that they say that the first sentence, the first sentence of your book is one of the most important parts of the book. So in LARP, what inspired your first sentence and how did you settle on it? Or do you personally think that the first sentence doesn't really matter? It's the whole book entirely. I mean, it, it matters from the perspective of selling the book, which I guess is a later thing we'll talk about. Um, I don't think the first sentence kind of really sets the tone for a book. It's not like writing an academic essay where your thesis statement is the first sentence you write, and it tells your professor what the whole paper's about. So, you know, from that emphasis, I don't think it's as important. I think the first sentence is really only important from a sales point of view. Uh, but that's that's really it. My first sentence came from just talking to my wife, an idea that she had of how, how to start the book off. And again, just what I saw in my head. The first sentence, I believe, is Sir Dengar stood at the top of the ravine uh, overlooking his kingdom or something. It's something like that. So this tells you that, you know, there's a guy, he's he's noble and he has a kingdom. But, you know, other than that, I don't see it as any sort of, you know, dramatic importance there. Do you have any recommendations from your experience uh, for other potential writers developing the beginning of their story, really making sure that they set the scene correctly? What recommendations or points, tips or tricks would you have for them? Well, a lot of what I read when, you know, writing the book, I read up on how other people write books, obviously. You know, in the old days, you could start off a book and you could really start telling your story. But nowadays, with everybody's attention span so incredibly short, they want you to start books off in the middle of an action. You know, you can't say that once upon a time, uh, you have to start things with like, he was running down the hallway hearing footsteps he had never heard before. Because people just, they want that immediate impact because of the way our society is. So you've got to recognize, you know, our times and everything. And, you know, in the old days, you could follow a, a master writer and sort of copy their style. But things are changing so quickly that you can't follow Hemingway or any of those guys anymore. You, you really got to pay attention to society and just know your audience is very, very important. And throughout this process, once you made it past the beginning or any point in your writing process, did you ever hit a wall? Maybe it was an emotional wall where you're like, I just don't want to work on this anymore. Or maybe there was a point where you thought your your book wasn't good enough. Or maybe you just couldn't figure out what the next action, what the next scene was going to be. Was there a point like that? And how did you break through if it was? Well, I never hit an emotional wall. I did kind of hit a creative wall in the ending uh, of the book. Not the last couple chapters, but like sort of the the climax action. And to this day, I'm really not happy with it but it was the best that I could do for the story. So I wasn't real sure how to, how to tie everything up and I did the best I could. But, you know, you see that in lots of creative endeavors where, you know, even the Beatles will, will say, if you read their interviews, that there's some parts of songs that they didn't like that they wrote or, or whatever. Um, sometimes you just do the best you can in the situation and it's just part of the story. It doesn't really define what the whole story is. Sure, sure. And I hear sometimes in, in live music, you hear the, the recorded version on the album, and then you hear the live version, and, and they change it. They consistently change the way they sing something, or they change a verse entirely, and that might be them realizing a month or two after the release that, oh, I like this way better. I'm going to sing it that way from now on. Right, right. I think it, it was Hemingway who said, you know, a story is never finished. You know, I could still to this day be editing that story, but at some point, you just got to let it go. I mean... You just, you've got to do it. So how were you able to bring these characters to life? You had such fascinating characters in LARP. What helped you bring them to life and give them a true voice? Was it all in your head? Did you connect them with people that you knew? What was your process like for that? Um, the characters are based on some people that I've known, but not entirely. Like it's, it's elements of their personality. Like the character uh, of Mark, um, is based on a guy I grew up with, but not his entire character. You know, as the book says, you know, Mark lives in his parents' uh, attic and, you know, he collects toys. Well, yeah, my friend Mark did do that, but he was not a, an obnoxious blowhard like the character is. You know, the character of Dennis is partially me, uh, but not entirely me. So one of the benefits of writing 
is, that, that's wonderful is that you can take somebody you know, and if they have three or four different aspects of their personality, which a lot of people do, you can make that into three or four different characters. I, I could see these people in my head, uh, what they looked like, who they were, and you know, obviously I knew them in person, but I also wanted to tailor them to the message that I was trying to, to deliver of, you know, uh, personal value and, and all those kind of things. But again, you know, it's really hard to describe or relate that it's just what I saw in my head. It's everything that they said is what I could hear them saying. And, you know, whenever you're, you're writing a book with multiple characters, you almost become sort of like a method actor. And when you become those characters, when you're writing their dialogue. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, so what is the, the Dennis persona of me saying in this moment? You know, what would Mark say in this moment? And you, you become each of those characters. And I also wanted to include, and I did, um, strong female characters as well, because that's something you don't see a lot of in fantasy action, which is unfortunate. And, you know, LARPing is, is big time popular with women, uh, as I learned through my research. So, you know, I wanted to include everybody. I love it. How about the actual writing of the book? So personally, whenever I write, you know, when I was writing essays when I was in college or short stories or nonfiction or anything like that, I tend to write personally in small sections and just spill my spill my guts, dump my mind and then add to it and have it grow and grow and grow. So I basically write the entire thing and then expand on it. Obviously, that process can't really work if you have a 200, 300 page book. So I'm curious to see how did you write the book? Was it more chronological, like you just added more to it day by day? Did you do it in pieces and put the whole thing together? What was that process like? Yeah, I did it chronologically uh, because I, I couldn't like write, you know, the the third quarter, I guess, of it and then go back and write the beginning. And then uh, I, I have to think linear uh, when I write. Did you ever have to go back and edit things, I'm sure, a lot along the process as you got towards the middle or the end and realized, ah, oh, that character probably wouldn't have done that action at the beginning? Not a lot, no. Just that, that was very minimal um, because I thought about it for so long and I'd spent so much time outlining and just really contemplating this that everything was so fully developed in my head that I could just knock it out. But something that I want to emphasize here, too, that is really important that changed my writing. I mean, I've been writing and collecting my writings for like 25 years or more, like really working at it. I haven't worked on it so much lately because, you know, fatherhood and all. Um, but, you know, there was a time when I really, really worked on it. And something that changed my writing and really improved it was uh, a belief that Jack Kerouac held. And so did... You've heard of the Beatnik generation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that that was his generation. And they all believed in first thought, best thought, which means that when you're writing, you don't edit yourself. Whatever you're thinking, just write it. Because a lot of times people are writing and they'll stop and say, oh, no, that's not good. Let me fix this. Let me go. With, with first thought, best thought, you don't do that. You just let it out. And you don't correct yourself. You don't do anything. And that took my writing to a whole nother level when I was actively, you know, really, really working it. The ideas came much better because subconsciously I wasn't stopping myself from having ideas. Right. I think that's huge. Yeah, it, it is huge. And that's something that, you know, I think all young writers or even older ones really need to know is, you know, if you've got the idea, just let it out. And you can go back and fix it later, but don't fix it in the moment because I find sometimes the moment passes and you can't recapture it. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. So, you know, if you're, and that's what I did with LARP here is I didn't really censor myself or correct myself in any way. I just let it go. Yeah. I had a, a similar experience when I was in college. I was a student who actually didn't procrastinate. In fact, I was the opposite. I would get to, I would get to work on things almost immediately and spend probably 90% of the you know, the window of working on this project, essay, or whatever, in the planning stage, researching tons, making note cards, highlighting books, putting sticky notes here and there and there. I spent so much time in the preparation stage to make sure everything would be perfect that I barely left myself enough time to actually write. So in the end, 
I wasn't able to put forth my best work because I spent so much time planning. So I had an experience with a mentor in college mm-hmm. who said, stop planning so much. You know what you're talking about. Just write. Write that first edition. Yeah. Don't edit it at all. What you, you can do that afterwards. The first thing you should do is write that sucker from start to finish, and then we'll pretty it up. All right. But for now, just get to writing. And I yep. think that helped me a lot as uh, as just someone who just put way too much time in the planning stage. Yeah. I mean, you just got to let it fly. And that's what the editing stage is all about. So mm. just get it out. Now, that was a beautiful transition <laughs> into, <laughs> part, into part four. We're going to talk about the editing process, which can be incredibly tedious. And it's not a one time edit. Uh, Justin, I'm sure it was editing for you one after the other after the other. And then you have to pass it off to a publisher who's going to do some editing themselves. So, Justin, tell us about your editing process for your book. Did you do it, um, you know, as you progress through or did you save it all for the end? What was that like? Uh, I think if I recall, I did roughly 13 edits of the book and that is front to back editing. Um, I did not edit it as I wrote. I wrote the entire book and then I went back and edited for, you know, continuity, grammar, maybe using better words throwing in, you know, better ideas that I thought about, you know, I'm on chapter eight. I thought of something better for chapter one, but yeah, I did 13 edits of the book and it took me about nine months to write the book. Um, And again, that's not writing, you know, eight hours a day, every day, it's writing two hours on a Sunday and then, you know, an hour on a Wednesday. And it took me maybe, I would say, uh, I don't know, six months to a year to do the editing in the same fashion where I wasn't doing it every day. So the whole process from the time I wrote the first page till it was completely done was about a year and a half. Right, right. I, as far as the podcast goes, it takes me about a half an hour to put the interview outlines together, about an hour to record the show, but about eight hours to edit everything, put the whole episode together as I want it to be and present it. So there's a lot of work behind the scenes that I think people should know about as far as the editing goes. And I'm glad you shared that. Did you enjoy the editing process? I know some people like it. I know some people absolutely dread the editing process. What were your thoughts? No, I, I did enjoy it because it was adding more color to the picture. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, or it was like, it was already colored and I was putting it into 4k where it was like, you know, super spectacular. Um, I didn't have any problem doing it at all other than I wanted it to be done and send it out into the world. But I had to sort of, you know, I had to work within my own brain to, to control my, my tendency to, uh, to rush things. And I had to take it slow and be methodical about it. But I, I didn't dislike the process at all. And you give a good point there that, uh, you know, some people just want to put it out there in the world and some people are perfectionists. They want to make sure that every single thing is exactly the way they want it to be. And oftentimes they'll never reach that point if they really wanted to. So what kind of tips and tricks do you have for a potential writer who gets to this stage to make the editing process easier and less perhaps frustrating? Um, Just look at it as part of the writing. Don't look at it like you're doing something that is you know, like a necessary evil or something like that. Just look at it as part of the creation process and don't have a negative view of it because what you're doing is, is you're making your product the best that it can be. You know, just writing something and, and sending it out there is is kind of careless. So, you know, one of my favorite writers is, uh, is Rod Serling, who created The Twilight Zone. And he always said, don't sign your name to anything that you would be ashamed of. This is your product, so you want it to be the best that it can possibly be. So editing really shouldn't be a burden. It should just be an accepted part. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most important parts, right? Because if you're going to if you're going to put so much time and effort into writing this book and you're not going to polish it up and make it as presentable as it possibly can be, you might not end up getting it published. Right. You know, if, if an editor and a publishing company looks at this and sees typos and, and active passive voice back and forth and how this character changes so dramatically with no reason behind it, they're going to, they're going to send it back to you. So editing is probably one of the most important points of it. So. Perfect. So we've made it through the first four aspects of how to write a book. We talked about before the book, where the idea comes from, if you have any type of mentorship. And you said you didn't specifically have a mentor, but you certainly had authors that gave you your voice and helped inspire you to do this. So I think that's a role model in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We moved through the how to start aspect of the book. 
and then the writing process and the editing process. So this is where it all comes to fruition the publishing and marketing aspect of it. Now today, Justin, well, let me ask you this. How long ago was LARP published? Uh, about nine years ago. Nine years ago. Okay. Uh, back then, was self-publishing books as popular as it is nowadays? No, it wasn't. But, you know, it, to answer your question, no, it wasn't. Um, but, you know, it was certainly an option for me, but I did not choose to go that route. I chose to shop it, which was, you know, it was as painful as I expected. And at the same time, not as painful as I expected. Um, there's a website called Agent, agentquery.com. And you can go there and type in what kind of book you've written. So if you've written sci-fi, you, you click the little sci-fi box and all the agents who represent sci-fi authors pop up and what you do is you start submitting your manuscript to these agents in the hopes that one of them will say yes and shop it to a big label and i did that and i got like 70 rejections so you know as i've read about other authors they got a lot of rejections too so you know i thought okay well i'm just in good company here uh so what i started to do was i started to shop the book to uh small indie publishers and, you know, to be clear, an indie publisher doesn't charge for publishing. If somebody is trying to charge you to publish something, then you should run away as fast as you can because you're going to end up like it's going to be a money pit situation for you. So I started submitting to indie publishers and I found one who was interested in, in the topic, thought it was a good book, and I hired a publicist to help me promote the book. and. You know, that's how it got published. It, it, it was not a self-published book. The The publisher took on the responsibility of marketing and promoting and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Once the, the publishing contract ended, which was, I think I had a three-year contract, then the rights reverted back to me. So it is now, you know, I published it on Amazon myself once I got the contract rights back. But initially, it was not a self-published book. Okay. Yeah, because nowadays, I know a lot of the people that I follow uh, that are, you know, entrepreneurs or or any type of, of person who's looking to market something, oftentimes they go the self-publishing route because there's different amounts of, you know, copyright that you have and ownership over it. You make a different percentage of the profits whenever you're selling things. And I think it's important to understand what type of person would want to go for the traditionally published route and what type of person would want to go for the self-published route. Because someone who doesn't enjoy the marketing and, and publicist aspect of things probably isn't going to want to self-publish things. So, Justin, from your experiences and your research, can you talk to us about what the pros and cons would be of publishing something traditionally versus self-publishing something? So, you know, going the traditional route, there's more, um, there's more support from the label and it looks nice and it's impressive. Going the self-publishing route, you know, I mean, anybody can do it. It's like calling yourself, I guess, a rock star and saying, well, I have a video on YouTube. Yeah, but you put it on YouTube. It's not like having your, like Warner Brothers Records putting your video on YouTube. So, you know, there's, it, I guess it depends on, on what your end game is and what you're hoping to accomplish. If you just want to see your work in a book form, then, then self-publishing is for you. But if you want to, I guess, be seen as a professional writer and taken seriously, then uh, traditional publishing is probably the way you want to go. As I said, I hired a publicist and, you know, that was really useful for me. Um, on the back of my book, I have a, a praise quote from Jonathan Mayberry, who's a New York Times bestselling author. And I wouldn't have had that had I not had a publicist because she had a connection to him in some way and she was able to get the book to him for a praise quote. So those kind of things are useful. I think self-publishing also is okay for individuals who already have a large platform and audience. Well, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you if you ha are, have some type of audience, whether you're on YouTube or you have a giant blog or you have a big website or something like that, you already have the audience that you know you yep. can sell this to. So it would make sense because you're going to earn a higher profit margin self-publishing than rather than going through the traditionally published. But if you're you know an average person like you and I, Traditional published oftentimes is the route that we want to go. Plus, it proves that our book, you know, 
deserves to make it because it has to pass those tests through all those editors and get rejected and accepted. And you have to make sure that you go through that editing process and make sure it's perfect. Because if you're going to self-publish it, it doesn't matter what it looks like. And uh, essentially, you know, if you, as long as you don't care how many books you're going to sell. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've read some self-published books that were absolutely horrible, but you know, at the same time, I've read books by big time authors and I see big time grammatical errors in them too. So, you know, who's to say what's right? Sure. Sure. hundred percent. I think it's just important to understand the sides of each and what, what could be best for you. But I know self-publishing is growing a lot more. What are your thoughts on eBooks nowadays? Well, a lot of indie books, um, a lot of indie publishers are going with eBooks simply because it's, it's cost effective. You know, you don't have to actually produce a product. So, and a lot of people are buying more eBooks than anything else. Like I haven't really, I read a lot, but I really haven't bought um, a, 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 like a paperback in a long time. I don't have the room for it in my house. But, you know, if I buy an ebook, I have it with me everywhere. So I don't think that there is a, a negative to, to ebooks anymore because everybody's doing it. I mean, Stephen King has ebooks. Uh, everybody has ebooks. So I don't see a, a negative there at all. I used to listen to audiobooks, mm -hmm. but I always felt like I was cheating. <laughs> yes, I Cause, agree. Because I would say, hey, I, I read Lord of the Rings. And, I, and I'm like, I didn't read Lord of the Rings. No. I listened on my way to work for a month. So uh, you said you agree. Go into a little more detail. What are your thoughts on on making the claim that you read a book if you you listen through audiobook? What's your what's your thoughts on audiobooks? Well, for me, it's um, it depends on what kind of book it is. You know, like I would not want to read or listen to The Great Gatsby through an audiobook because that book is so beautifully written that I want to see the words and I want to absorb the language. But if I was doing an audio, if I was listening to an audio book about, you know, how to complete a task of some sort, then that would be fine because it's, it's instructional. But for me, you know, things that are, that are, uh, have artistic value, you know, if, if I had heard the audio book of that Jack Kerouac book that I mentioned, I probably wouldn't have been affected by it as hugely as I was in actually reading it because I read that first page, I bet you 10 times in a row just trying to absorb it because it hit me so hard that I couldn't believe what I was reading. But in an audiobook, that first page goes by in five or eight seconds and then it's gone. I would rather see it in front of me and just be able to take it in. And and there's not as much attention and focus put towards an audiobook. Oftentimes no. if I was listening, I would be zoned out or I'd be doing the dishes or folding laundry or something like that. So I get it. I 100% I, I agree. I think there is an inherent value uh, to reading the book in itself and, and putting those images together and piecing the story together through your own eyes and as an experience. You know, books have been around for, for centuries, for, for thousands of years, and there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. So just an amazing, amazing overview. We've went through the five-step process here. We've concluded with marketing, but there is one more marketing question I have for you. Was there something that you wish you would have done or focused on more when it came to marketing, looking back in hindsight, or maybe something that you wish you did less of? No, I think, you know, considering that I was, you know, financially responsible for part of my marketing, you know, the publisher did eBlast, they did, you know, Twitter and Instagram and podcast interviews and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I really hit it hard myself having a, um, you know, I told you my undergrad is in professional writing, but a lot of my training was in marketing and advertising. So I knew how to market myself. And I really hit as much local marketing as I could that really wasn't that expensive. You know, for example, there is a, a magazine that goes out to all of the teachers in Pennsylvania who are union members, which is thousands and thousands of teachers. And I got my book a write-up in that magazine. I was in the local newspaper. I submitted it to the Post-Gazette, and the Post-Gazette gave me a great review. Uh, the Tribune Review did a, a story on it. So I worked as much marketing as I could within my, my, um, my area of reach. And I don't really have any regrets at all. I, I did the best I could with, with what I had. 
yeah, it sounds like throughout your whole process, you did what you set out to do. You had very little regrets. You didn't have too many complications or issues. So it sounds like you had a pretty great experience, but uh, there's always some difficulties and frustrations throughout the process. But would you see yourself writing another book in the future? Yeah, I actually am right now. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm doing the best I can with it. I'm spending as much time on as it is as I can, given my life circumstances. Um, sure. But, you know, in some ways, as you get older and you get more life responsibility, I said earlier that you you really can't turn off the writing part of your brain uh, if you're truly a writer. But sometimes you have to silence it a little bit. And, you know, as you get more life responsibility, you have to silence certain things. Uh, I would love, you know, baseball is my favorite thing in the world or one of my favorite things. And I played forever and ever and ever. And I can still play because I'm in great shape. But I can't play anymore because I coach my son's little league and some things are more important than others. So, you know, I've hung it up for a while. Maybe when he's older, I can play. But right now I can't. Um, so, you know, I don't have any regrets in, in the way that it was handled. And I'm working on a new book as much as I possibly can. And hopefully it will see the light of day at some point. Awesome, Justin. Thank you so much. We're going to open the floor to our listeners here. Uh, Justin, if you're familiar with the podcast, you'll know that we have listener questions every single interview where our guests will shout out questions to the upcoming guests that we have on. So two listener questions for you, Justin. The first one is, how do I know that my idea for a book is a good one? What can I do to find out that my idea is worth writing a book about? Well, you don't write a book to make money or you don't write a book to get value. You write a book because you want to write a book. And if, a, if it's an idea that does not leave you alone, then it's a good idea. I mean, I've had lots of ideas that I've forgotten about, but there's some that I've never forgotten about and that I'm working on. So, you know, if it's something that doesn't leave you alone, then pursue it. And if nothing comes of it, you've created something that has never existed before. And if you want to see it in print, then you can do the self-publishing route. But, you know, I say if, if, you, if you feel it's something good, then do it. Don't let other people value or judge your ideas. Just do it. If you have it in your brain, just do it. Did you run your idea past anyone outside of your wife, any friends or family before you, you committed to it? Or regardless of what they were going to say, were you going to go after it? Um, it really didn't matter what anybody thought. It was right. I was just doing it. Um, I figured that this was you know, a, a really great idea that would appeal to people. And I, I was just going to do it. And, you know, it's funny, just the other day, uh, I got a, a $40 uh, PayPal payment from Amazon for book royalties. So almost 10 years later, people are still buying my book. Uh, yeah, it was only $40, but people are still buying my book. So yeah, that's that's the important thing. The 40 bucks is cool. But the fact that people still care, and the people are still finding out about it and finding value is uh I'm sure a, a beautiful thing. Cool. So uh, last question here. We all have perceptions on what things are going to be like before we get into it. For instance, both you and I are teachers, and we had perceptions on what teaching was going to be like while we were in college, once we were about to get into the field. So writing, I'm sure, is a very similar thing. With all the perceptions you had in your head before you got into the process, what was the biggest realization that you made while writing LARP? It would probably go along with the finding a publisher kind of thing. Again, I didn't expect to find a publisher, and I knew it was going to be tough. But getting rejection after rejection after rejection, as I said, I got like 70 of them, was kind of tough to deal with. It wasn't really discouraging, but when you create something and you put your, you know, your heart and your soul into it, and all of these people are telling you no, that's kind of tough to deal with. But, you know, every author that has, has ever mattered has been rejected, you know, dozens of times. So I just kept that in my head that that's, you know, that's the way it goes. I mean, there's so many famous stories about, you know, so many people getting rejected. Like, you know, the Beatles were rejected by Decca Records. Like, they're probably still regretting that. <laughs> so, you know, everybody gets rejected. It's just how it is. And you just got to put into your mind that it's going to happen. It's going to happen a lot. And it doesn't, it doesn't speak to the value of your work. It's just what the process is. Sure. And rejection is, is a part of life. And yep. we have to know that mistakes are bound to happen. And if we were perfect in every aspect, there would be no drive to get better. 
Right. And that's that's kind of what the podcast is all about, to learn new things and and grow in every way, shape or form. So, Justin, thank you for your insight. Uh, I'm more inspired than ever uh, to take what we've been doing here on Humans of Teaching, perhaps incorporating that into some book in the future. But thank you so much for all of your words of wisdom. Let's wrap things up here. I'm going to give you the floor. Justin, share anything you would like to about projects that you're currently working on. Maybe you want to pitch a little elevator pitch about your upcoming book or keep Keep it a secret, totally fine. But anything else you want to advertise, the floor is yours, brother. Yeah, um, you know, if anybody's interested in reading LARP, uh, it's available on Amazon in both uh, digital and uh, paperback. Uh, I also have a book that I wrote 16 years ago already uh, called Revolutions. It's a poetry novel. I call it a poetry novel because it is my diary written in poetry format. So it actually tells a story through poetry. Uh, but both of those are available on Amazon. And I hope everybody uh, buys 55 copies so that I can maybe not work as hard in teaching. <laughs> 55 on the dot, not 54, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Remember, you got 55. 55. That's, our, that's our number. Well, you deserve it. Thank you so much for the insight, Justin. We appreciate all of your insight on how to write a book. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Justin's interview was amazing here today, folks. I hope you enjoyed a lot of it. The workshop style of lessons I just absolutely love, and I can't wait to do more of them. I truly took away so much from how Justin goes about writing. You see, his way of saying that you can write however you see fit. You don't need to have a deadline. You don't need to have a schedule. You don't need to make sure that you have all of these things set up and you have a mentor and you go through this process and that process because everyone is different. His discussions about being a Mozart type of artist versus a Beethoven type of artist really, really hit home. And some people can just sit down and write while others have to wait until that creativity hits them. And many of us are teachers that are listening and we don't have all the time in the world to be able to write. And I love that he was able to put together an amazing book and prove that it can be done in not that long a time by just sitting down when you can and just chugging away at it. Folks, I hope that this lesson and this workshop inspired you to go after the dream of writing a book that many of you have. And if you don't have that dream, perhaps you have it now. Folks, if you have any suggestions for upcoming workshops or upcoming interviews, please make sure to reach out to us at humansofteaching at gmail.com. We have so many ideas for upcoming workshops that teach you and every single listener something new, whether it's a skill or concept. Folks, before we sign off, we just want to let you know one more time how important you are to this podcast. Please make sure that you share this with someone who could find value from it, whether it's 1, 10, 15, 100 people <laughs> that, uh, that would find value from this episode. If you know someone who's interested in writing a book, this is a pretty great description on how to go about doing it. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. We appreciate each and every one of you who tune into Humans of Teaching for each new interview, story, and perspective. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already, and follow us on Twitter at Humans of Podcast. If there is someone you know who would find value from this episode or Humans of Teaching in general, please share it with them. This podcast was made to inspire teachers and the more we can share it with, the better. If you or someone you know is a teacher of any kind and have a unique perspective or story to share, we'd love to hear it. Please email humansofteaching at gmail.com for a chance to appear on our show. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time.